welcome to Your Concerns in Health. I'm Dr. Barbara Kostick. This program is a roundtable discussion with experts from a variety of fields to discuss issues that relate to you and your health. The topics do not have clear-cut solutions. What may be the right choice for one person may not be the same choice for another. Today's topic can make anyone anxious, but we in the medical field are faced with end-of-life care decisions almost every day. Talking about death can be uncomfortable. Thinking about death, especially when caring for a loved one, can be frightening. That's why advanced care planning is so important. An individual's personal wishes and beliefs are vital when making care decisions regarding an end-of-life situation. And these wishes can be known only if they are discussed and documented. Advanced care planning allows people to define their medical care preferences before they face the predicament of not being able to speak for themselves. To help us explore this issue are experts. Critical care physician, Dr. Carmesita Akawili. Internist, Dr. Michael Parmley and registered nurse, Doug Van Houten, who's been a critical care nurse for over 25 years. Doug, what is the meaning of end-of-life care? Well, Barbara, um, end-of-life care is sort of the all-inclusive approach to uh, caring for the dying. It's not just like giving an antibiotic for an infection or something. It includes uh, spiritual issues, um, psychological, um, social sort of issues, as well as symptom management, pain, that sort of thing. In um, critical care, the primary goal is to, to save that patient from the acute threats of their, to their lives. I'm George. How are you? I'm While everyone. restoring and maintaining life. Ah, how are you doing today? Not better? In 70 to 95 percent of patients were able to do that. But in some of them, there's this chains of goals from cure to comfort. And this transition is the hardest for doctors and nurses to deal with. This transition is what you call the end of life care. The transition from curing aggressive medical treatment and explaining to the family that there will be a change of goal. Because you have done everything you can to save that patient's life to help him medically. Mike, do you discuss these issues in your office too? All the time actually. It's come up more often, I think, because some of the famous cases in the media that people discuss, and they come in and want to talk about it. And that's great, because before, sometimes it wouldn't come up. I would think it'd be really uncomfortable to bring up these issues. It often is. I mean, when people um, have to think about their own death, their own mortality, it, it sometimes puts a little damper on the conversation. Uh, unfortunately, it's something that all of us are going to go through you know, at some point. And so we all need to discuss this, or at least think about it, uh, while we can talk about it, before we lose the ability to tell people, you know, what we want to do. What's important is knowing what the person's perspective is, what on, on their life, what's important to them, not what's important to me. What's important to them and their culture and their family? What kind of things do they want to be able to do in their life? If they weren't able to do something like uh, walk in the park or laugh or even talk, would they really um, want to be kept alive under any circumstances? Well, we're talking about this being sort of hard for physicians to make that transition. I think it's equally hard for families. It's a pretty awesome responsibility that families take on that way. That's, uh, that's the person they call a surrogate decision maker. And that's when you can't make your own decisions. Correct. How do they determine the surrogate? When a patient's come to the unit, uh, if a patient is talking, then we don't have a problem with autonomy. But otherwise, most of the time the patients are not able to because of sedation or their illnesses. So you need to find out from the family who is the decision maker, who has the power of attorney. Okay. That's how you find out who is the surrogate decision maker for that patient. What if there is no official document or anything? Then who is the decision maker? Then usually what we suggest is to talk amongst themselves 
and either the whole family will have a consensus in terms of dealing with life and death decisions mm -hmm. or to assign somebody and it should be all of them as much as possible to communicate to them. So it's kind of hard sometimes the eldest culturally sometimes the eldest is an, in an Asian family would be the decision maker mm -hmm. and in some other family culturally and religiously it's a consensus so it's also different so you need really need to ask that initially also who would be the one with the power of attorney who's going to decide on the medical as well as the end of life care on this patient well what about in the office mike probably do you always see people that can make their own decisions no not all the time it's obviously easier when people can make their own mm -hmm. decisions um, sometimes people will come in and because of Alzheimer's disease or a stroke or some other severe illness, they can't make their own decisions. What you try and do is get a sense from their family, from their spouses, their children, what they would have wanted, mm -hmm. what, what's, what things are important to them. And always remember when you're asking people, ask them to put themselves in the position of the patient. Mm -hmm. What would they want? Not their own values. Right, or not what I want, yeah. what they want. Well, how, how do we determine medical competence then? You said that the patient had to be able to communicate. Are there, is there anything else that the patient has to be able to do to make their own decisions? It's always nice to have a consensus. If you're of legal age and you can communicate, competence is not just being able to communicate. You know, you as a doctor would have to go to a process of examination in terms of does this patient understand what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So know? understanding, the patient has to understand what his options are, yes. right? Yeah. And then he has to understand. It's important to, to talk to the patient and you get a, start to get a sense of whether or not they understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Do they understand their illness? Do they understand the consequences of their decisions? Mm -hmm. That's the important thing. If somebody does understand those things, then that's very, very helpful. When you get a sense that they're, they, they're living in the past mm -hmm. with Alzheimer's disease, or they, they don't understand that they're sick, mm -hmm. or they don't even remember that you talked to them you know, last week, then you have to start shifting some of the burdens to the family or their medical decision maker. So I guess we need to think about this before we get to that point. That'd be the great thing. Uh, we try to tell patients and family this all the time. Uh, and there's a way to really do it. There are advanced healthcare directives that are a, uh, sort of a structure for you to put down the, the ideas that you have. Now I have to determine my surrogate. What would be the advanced care directive for that? You, you said, Carmen, you said it was what, a, a power of attorney or something like that that you would fill out? either you have a power of attorney for your advanced health care directive, you have a power of attorney for your mm -hmm. other reasons like financial, but uh -huh. you also have one for your health care directive. So your medical and you power start. of attorney where you designate yeah. who your surrogate is. Exactly. It's, it's so important to talk to that surrogate. You assign mm -hmm. somebody, but it's so important <laughs> to talk to that person and you have hopefully have the same values and your goals and you have to talk to that somebody about what you want because you don't want that person to be guessing what you want at the end of life. Well, and I think you don't want that person to decide that they aren't going to honor what your, your desires yeah. are. That, that would be the other exactly. thing that would bother me, you know, and the strength yeah. of them. And we see that happening too, I, I would think. And these are hard conversations. This isn't, you know, Sunday afternoon fun conversation. I mean, you're talking about end of life and you've got to anticipate when we're all going to reach that point, we have to come up with the decisions about what it really ought to be like. Because in my experience, it's always been a little different for each person. And you add a uh, big mixture of cultures and that sort of thing, things change a lot. Yeah, because you were saying that it could be the eldest son, it, could, it doesn't have to always be the spouse, it, it could be something else. Absolutely. And then significant others. You know, I would assume those have to be really documented exactly. well, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's interesting because sometimes we just naturally think of our spouse as being the person, but sometimes you have to really think about it. Is my spouse going to be the best person? And I know a lot of people who've, uh, who've, who've said, I don't want my spouse to do it, I actually want my brother, or I want my cousin, or my best friend. Something like that, those people can remain impartial and really follow through with the things that you want. But we want people to make those decisions so we don't have to play guessing games yeah. as to yeah. who who did they really want to make the decisions? And when somebody brings me one of those forms, I don't like to just read it and put it in the chart. We try and discuss it so we can get a sense of that, and then I'll make my own notations. What do they want? Mm -hmm. And under what circumstances? Just to help us understand, as well as just having this piece of paper. Yeah. It's a little bit harder, though, in in the ICU sometimes when you haven't known the patient. Well, I think that's well, true. When I was in private practice, uh, it's not just being able to leave, but what exactly do you want? Being able to drink my cup of coffee in the morning, be able to exercise, be able to talk, be able to eat, you know. But yeah. for some people, their quality of life is just being able to leave. We have to respect that, whether we, you know, mm -hmm. we like it or not. That's patient's autonomy. What they want to do with their lives is their life. And you have the hallmark of this patient autonomy is to respect what they like. But at least for the people around there uh, thinking about doing an advanced healthcare directive, you need to be specific in terms of the kind of life you want mm -hmm. if you survive this end of life problem. Are there certain forms for that where you can kind of decide what kind of quality of life you want? There's actually a great number of forms. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very simple to fill out and even at a, at a fifth grade level. Uh, there's other like the five wishes, which is very involved and talks about, gee, what sort of music do you want played at your funeral? Do you want somebody to read poetry to you uh, as you're in your sick bed? So those things can change quite a bit. There's, there's a standard form that we use in the hospital as well that's just sort of basic. Do you ever use like the five wishes? and? that form in your practice? What I use is what, whatever the patient's comfortable with. Mm -hmm. It's not so much important to me what form they fill out. It's that they talk about it mm. with, them, with the families, with the, you know, the people who are important to them, mm -hmm. and then to me. So, so we can sort of, at least I can um, get a sense of what they want. But they need to talk about it amongst their families too mm -hmm. because when the time comes, if it does, and they can't talk about it, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we were all on the same page. Yeah. You know, Barbara, uh, in the ICU, 90%, I think, of the patient does not have advanced health care directive. Oh, and so that's why we're trying to encourage uh, everybody to kind of fill out something or at least talk about it, as you said, mm -hmm. to trying to get their wishes. The other thing that we do, aside from family, is the primary care doctor is very important in this. We should talk to our primary care doctor about end of life, especially if we have chronic illnesses, if we are yeah. older, and things like that. Those are the realities of life. The truth about life is that you don't want to die, number one. Number two is that we cannot predict when are you going to die, even mm -hmm. in the best medical practice. You cannot predict that. Yeah. So it's painful, but it needs to be done, you know, because of all these things. Speaking of that, isn't there a new form out? There is a new form, and it's called POLST, Physicians Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Mm -hmm. It's very specific because right here it says, person has no pulse and is not breathing. So for it's not quite an advanced directive, it's a pre-hospital physician's order. And it's portable. It can go from one hospital to another to a skilled nursing facility. Mm. But it lays out specific orders that need to be followed and honored by the hospital where the patient's admitted. And on that form, I think it, it does have you designate a surrogate. And then it also talks about things like, should you have CPR? Yeah, if, if they found you in the state of cardiac arrest, do you want mm -hmm. the emergency process and everything to happen right away? CPR and mm -hmm. chest compressions, that sort of thing. But, yeah. but it addresses other things, too, the level of intensity of that response. Mm -hmm. Maybe you just want comfort measures only. We use the term in medicine, DNR, do not resuscitate. And, and I think that's probably a misnomer, because what we really mean is to allow natural death. Do not resuscitate does not mean do not care. Mm -hmm. If you are do not resuscitate, 
and for example, you have pneumonia and that's treatable, you treat that. It doesn't mean that, you know, they're not gonna give you treatment when mm -hmm. it's needed. It's only at the end of life when your heart stops and your breathing stops, then you don't want that life support. Mm -hmm. That's what DNR means to me. Okay. And then there's certain other decisions you make on that form too, aren't there? Um, you can also uh, talk about, do you see yourself getting um, artificial nutrition, like through a tube of some sort? Mm -hmm. That's addressed as well on there. So it allows you to sort of think ahead a little bit. So you can pick the level where you, you want the interventions to stop or start? Yeah, but again, this is very specific. It's not mm -hmm. quite like an advanced directive. This is a, an order that's signed by the doctor. If you happen to be, say, in a skilled nursing facility and uh, you're found in a, a state of near arrest or something mm -hmm. and they call 911 and you go to the emergency room, that doctor there has got some direction as to where to go. And these are actual orders. Mm -hmm. And that means also paramedics have to honor those orders too. Absolutely. And, and this has been taught throughout the medical system, so uh, emergency medical service uh, providers understand it clearly. Mike, have you been using that, that form yet in your office? Um, it's only come up a couple of times so mm -hmm. far. It, it, we generally don't use this in our general discussion of advanced directives. Mm -hmm. um, it's more often useful when people are towards or nearer to the end of their life. Mm -hmm. um, when people have chronic conditions that may limit their life expectancy to the next few years, and th that's the time where they start exactly. making decisions. You know, what do they, what do they want to do? And it, the the advantage of it is that it's honored anywhere. Mm -hmm. When when I sign the form, it's portable with the patient, so that it can uh, it follows them around. So people, if the patient becomes incapacitated or there's no sort good decision maker available, mm -hmm. they know what to do. Well, I think it would be really useful in someone, say, if they had a chronic condition, say their, their heart was very, very weak. You know, maybe that's where they don't want. They don't want their heart started. They'd like to be treated for pneumonia, but they know their heart really won't handle the resuscitation anyway. Or what about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Absolutely. That's a chronic condition that quickly leads uh, to a very uh, poor level at mm -hmm. some point. Um, and I think we need to differentiate. Pulsed is something for people with really chronic conditions like COPD. Um, an advanced health care directive, um, anyone over the age of 18 ought to have something like that. I mean, you do, I mean, if nothing more for just to identify who should make decisions mm -hmm. for you. It's when you start to deteriorate, like Mike said, that's when, uh, or you get elderly, that's the, that's the point where you really need that pulsed. And then we talked about comfort care, that just because you say you don't want your heart restarted doesn't mean that you don't have care. Exactly. And so care has been, in the ICU, care is there from the start to finish. Mm -hmm. And care with uh, cure, care with cure. The other one mm -hmm. is care plus comfort at the end of life. So care has been, is started, but the life support is different. You know, when you say do not resuscitate, you want to withhold life support or withdraw life support. Mm -hmm. yeah, DNR or do not resuscitate never means do not treat. We always want to treat the patient, mm -hmm. whether it's treat them to try and improve the condition or treat them to keep them comfortable um, as a death That's approaches. Right. That's another reason I like the allow natural death on that form because it makes it clear that we're we may allow a natural death, but we're not going to stop taking care of the patient. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and we have other options for people after they've decided that there's no further medical care that can help them too. Absolutely. Hospice, uh, which is usually reserved for people who have a life expectancy of six months or less, or palliative care, which is sort of this, a similar situation. A uh, patient has a very severe chronic condition, but they need help keeping them comfortable while we still treat them to some extent. Well, when we come back, we're going to look at some of these scenarios that illustrate these issues and options surrounding the end-of-life care. <laughs> We have a better way to treat brain tumors without surgery or anesthesia. There are no knives, no cutting. 
no nausea or hair loss. And no hospital stay is required. Presenting outpatient gamma knife treatment at the Taylor McAdam Bell Neuroscience Institute in Fremont. Go to GammaKnifeProgram.com to learn more. You were not created in two dimensions. You are a complex construction of muscle and bone, blood vessels and synapses. Seeing your inner workings takes some equally sophisticated technology. That's why at Washington Hospital Outpatient Imaging Center, we've invested in the most advanced digital imaging equipment so we can diagnose you quickly and accurately. We see the whole you to treat the whole you. Go to whhs.com to learn more. Welcome back to our discussion on the importance of advanced care planning. Let's look at some examples that illustrate issues and options. Our first scenario is common when no advanced directive has been created. The situation is a 32-year-old father with a wife and two children. He hasn't made any advanced directives due to his young age and good health. However, this morning the patient was found comatose. He was taken to the hospital and is now in intensive care with a ruptured aneurysm. He responds to pain but does not communicate. He can move his extremities, but not to commands, only to pain. What's wrong, Carmen? What do we do? So this patient has brain, ruptured brain aneurysm. Yes. Right? Comatous, responding only to pain, but it, is it purposeful? You know, you assess the patient neurologically, mm -hmm. and then assess whether there's spontaneous breathing. So you assess the mental state, mm -hmm. assess for spontaneous breathing, you go to the whole shebang of neurological examination and determine in your examination whether this patient um, has a good prognosis or not. Mm -hmm. And you found in this case that he doesn't, so Doug, what happens? The key thing in the ICU is the family conference. And it's a multidisciplinary approach led by the key physician. The most important is you have the key family members, the stakeholders there. And you try to review the whole case. The physician usually provides a medical update about what's going on, and these are tough things to talk about. We generally start working on goals. What are the family's goals? What goals are realistic? What do the medical team want to accomplish? It's still patient-focused. We, we got to be thinking about what the patient would say he wants. You know, uh, if this was my dad, I might be saying, oh gee, I don't want to lose him, I want to fight like crazy, but I need to know what he would have wanted. It has to be focusing on him. And it's at this time you start to look for things like advanced health care directives. Maybe he has one. He does. Maybe we should look at that. If he doesn't have that, then you start to talk to the family. Your, your parents are still alive? What kind or? of person was he? Is he the sort of person that was out and active and busy every day? Is he the head of the family? How would he respond to the situation and what would he want? What would his wishes be? What was important to him? We have to give them objective, our objective findings of what we think the chances of this patient's recovering. And then we have to talk to them and say, what would he, would he want to live in a situation where he was chronically on a ventilator? Would he want to be treated when there's no hope of recovering, when he couldn't get out of bed, when he couldn't be active? Mm -hmm. What are the things that he enjoyed doing in life? What did he like? What would you do culturally? That, because legally, I think the spouse is the one who would be the surrogate in this case. But say Most culturally, you would look to the parents. Uh, what happens when they don't agree? As Doug was saying, a family conference is important. Tell them the medical issues, what is the prognosis, and then discuss with them uh, the patient's preference as what everybody is saying. And work together as a family. Sometimes we have a family conference, tell them what's going on, ask for the wishes mm -hmm. of the patient and the family, and then give our recommendation. Give them time to discuss among themselves. Mm -hmm always saying that it's because it's patient-centered. What do you think will your loved one want at this point in his mm -hmm. life? Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes there's a cultural, spiritual advisor That's that true. is helpful that we can bring in. And in fact, the hospital has volunteer chaplains uh, of the Muslim faith, Christian faith, Buddhist Hindu, faith. Buddhist, a lot yeah. of times those people can really come in and, and help us with the decision making. There will always be a conflict, but always you remind them about the best interest of the patient. You're not really making them decide. It's what the patient would really want at this point in his life. That it's way there's the no patient, guilt. It, yes. There's no guilt about what I want. It's not what you want, mom, I'm sorry. But what do you think would your patient or your brother would like at this point in his life? Is mm -hmm. he the type of person that would just want to live like a vegetable? Or is he the type who would like the encounter thing? So you give them a lot of time to think about it. Mm -hmm. And then we honor what they come together as a consensus and decide on. Okay, what about case number two? 62-year-old gentleman with lung cancer, previous smoker. He's battled this disease over a number of years. He's run out of medical interventions. No surgery will help, no radiation will help, no chemo will help. What do we do? Well, the, the first thing I remind my patients, if I ever say there's nothing that I can do for you, mm -hmm. you need to remind me that that's not true. <laughs> I can always help you. Mm -hmm. um, if we can't cure you, I can still help you keep comfortable, keep as much of a quality of life as you can. And I think that's important for the patient. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, there's been an ongoing relationship through, throughout the years where, and sometimes you see these people decline. And you can take it in steps or take it slowly. That doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it does sound like it. They've had a chance to discuss their advanced directive. We know what this patient would like. I know the patient fairly well, and we have a rapport. And he and his spouse have discussed it with you. The advanced directive is in the chart, and he said when he gets to the stage where there is no in medical intervention that will cure him, that he would like to have comfort care. This is a perfect situation where a patient could be a, referred to hospice care or palliative care. Care that helps keep them comfortable, keeps them pain-free, as in good of a condition as they can. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that the doctor's not there anymore. We still help, uh, we still give the hospice uh, organization their instructions and they keep us advised of things even sometimes from day to day how mm -hmm. they're going but it allows us to get a lot more support to the patient and their family. Now we've looked at two scenarios we've looked at at one where it was no advanced directive no planning and mm -hmm. the other one where there was planning. Have, do you have any studies that show that advanced planning makes a difference? You know, there are some great studies out of La Crosse, Wisconsin. Years ago, they got together as a community, and they're a pretty homogenous community, but they got together as a community and said, we're going to focus on advanced health care directives. And with time, they gradually built it up so that most of the people towards the end of life do have advanced health care directives. They are happier with the choices at the end of life. The length of stay in the hospital is better. When you're talking about uh, use of the healthcare dollar, they can focus on other things. But the key thing is that families are, um, are, have thought about it and they're happier with the outcomes. So quality of life is actually improved by using advanced care directives. E exactly. Exactly. Wow. We've had two different scenarios here. We've had the first one where there was no advanced directives. The second where there was advanced directives. We've found that having advanced directives does make a difference. So let's do this complicated third one. Let's talk about a 78-year-old woman who was very active. She suddenly has a catastrophic event, like a major stroke, and cannot pass a swallow evaluation, meaning that she cannot safely take oral food. Her family wants maximum treatment at this time but her advanced directives that she has told her internist state that if she cannot talk or laugh, which she cannot do right now, then she wants no medical assistance. And that includes a feeding tube. 
So what do we do? This is where uh, the communication skills of the clinician become really important. And uh, again, gathering the family around, talking about the situation. If they don't want to follow what is stated in the advanced directive, why? What makes them say that? And get that conversation going. Mm -hmm. The other scenario is the patient had a stroke. You want to talk to the neurologist if that stroke is going to improve. Mm -hmm. If it's going to be a temporary thing for that swallowing problem, that in three months maybe the patient can swallow again. So you want to make sure that it's clear that because of this stroke, this patient will never be able to swallow again. Because you can temporarily put in a feeding tube while you're trying to get that you know, process healed. But in your scenario, I think it's catastrophic. So mm -hmm. there's maybe that. the neurologist <laughs> will really say that there's no chance this patient will be able to swallow in her lifetime. And so again, you are right, you know, we need to have that family conference because there's conflict here. Mm -hmm. And discuss again, you know, explain to them the importance of the patient-centered care. Well, and we might have to even do a trial, right, to see if she improves over a few days. Yeah, we'll often do that. Um, one of the things that I found happens is that we as physicians or clinicians see this a lot. We see it all the time. This is maybe the first time that the, the patient's gone through this or mm -hmm. their family. And you have to give them sometimes days to work this out, to discuss it among mm -hmm. themselves, to sort of come to grips with it. Sometimes we compromise. Sometimes we say, well, let's feed her for a little while and see if she makes any recovery or changes. Even though our primary responsibility is towards the patient, Sometimes I feel like we're treating the family as well. That's why we have chaplains and, and other people to help mm -hmm. them because they're the ones that are going to have to deal with this emotionally and spiritually long term, the decisions that are made here. So it's important to, to do your best there so that they feel closure. They feel mm -hmm. like they've made the right decisions. They don't feel guilty. Well, and we want to feel that we've done the most we can do. We don't want to make a, a premature decision. We would like to be able to let the family discuss this within themselves, but guide them also. Mm -hmm. The main objective here is to respect that patient autonomy. It's not up to you or up to me, but eventually it will be something that's good for the patient. We need to respect his wishes. So sometimes it, it's time that heals them and make them, you know, do those decisions. You know, a trick I've used to keep this patient-centered is to always have this conference right around the bedside. I mean, here's the patient we're talking about right there, and if you're going to say something to that patient or about this patient, you're going to do it right there. I think it focuses everybody on, you know, we got to do what this patient wanted. There really is no escaping death. We, your medical team, want to implement your wishes. We need a clear and unambiguous concept of your desires regarding end-of-life care. The first step is to have a conversation with your family and do it now. Make sure everyone is clear about the specifics of your desires, including who is to make the decisions for you if you are incapable. Then, write all the details down. That is an advanced directive and you never know when you or your family might need it. Take this directive to your physician and explain what your desires are. Remember, you can always change your plan as your health circumstances may change. Thank you all for participating in this difficult discussion. And thank you for watching this session of Your Concerns in Health. For more information about decisions in end-of-life care, visit these websites.